When Nintendo released the NES in 1985, it completely revitalized the video game industry. It undid all the damage from the industry crash and cemented video games alongside movies, TV, and books as a viable entertainment medium. As a result, there were a lot of people making games for the first time, and there was a lot of really weird and bizarre games coming out for Nintendo's new system. So that's why today I wanted to talk about a game that's easily described as bizarre, The Adventures of Rad Gravity for the Nintendo Entertainment System. The Adventures of Rad Gravity is a side-scrolling platformer released for the NES in December of 1990, developed by Interplay and published by Activision. You control the titular Rad Gravity, a spacefaring hero who looks an awful lot like actor Bruce Campbell. In an age before cutscenes, the game's story is presented entirely in the instruction manual. It's the far future and humanity has developed a form of biotechnology called CompuMinds. The game's villain, Agathos, has hidden the CompuMinds until one, Kakos, was found. Now it's up to Rad and Kakos to traverse strange worlds and track the rest of the CompuMinds down. The game features some really interesting levels, such as the Asteroid Belt where you move by shooting, a section on Siberia where you enter a computer, and Turvia where everything is upside down. Enemy designs are pretty neat, with cool robots, magma men, and robo-Zeus, and at one point Cheech and Chong even steal Keikos out of your ship. Now I have to be honest with you, The Adventures of Rad Gravity is not a great game, and in fact even calling it a good game might be a stretch. I wouldn't even be surprised to see this game on an episode of Angry Video Game Nerd at some point in the future. But so why am I talking about it today? And it's because even though it's not that great, from an academic standpoint, it's definitely something worth playing. The Adventures of Rad Gravity encapsulates a lot of what the NES library was about. Tricky platforming, which is made worse by slippery controls and frustrating enemy placement, and not always making it clear what the player needs to do in order to progress. It makes the game hard, and not, I'll keep practicing and get better hard, but throw your controller across the room hard. This is when game developers were still figuring things out, with the success of the NES causing many upstart software development companies to try their hands at creating the next big thing. With console game development being new again, not everyone really had a grasp on what made a good game. At one point on a fluvia when chasing Cheech and Chong, you need to make several precision jumps while being harassed by unkillable enemies that latch onto you and pull you down. You will die over... ...and over... ...and over again. When you die, you have to start the entire level over from the beginning, but luckily any power-ups you've collected will remain in your inventory. Also bogging the whole thing down are enemies that force you to take hits in order to proceed, a painfully complex password system, and probably the worst title screen music in history. So this show is all about highlighting forgotten classic games, so why am I talking about this game if there's so many things wrong with it? And it's because even though it does have a lot of problems, it has a lot of really neat ideas, and in a lot of ways it kind of sums up what second-tier NES games were all about. At the time of this filming, on eBay you can get the cartridge only for under $10, and a box copy for about $20, so the price is right, and you're really not going to break the bank if you want to take a look at it. Getting past a lot of the issues the game has, it's still rather enjoyable. The game does have a certain amount of charm due to how wacky it is, and levels like Trivia are a lot of fun because, come on, how many other platformers literally turn the game upside down? Problem solving bits, like where you need to cross a river to get a bone, to convince a dog, to hurt a cow, so you can use him to reach a higher platform, are fun to figure out as well. Luckily, we live in the age of game facts, so the more ambiguous puzzles are much more manageable than they were back in the day. A game doesn't need to be great in order to be worth playing. It just needs to be interesting. I pride myself on being able to find the good qualities in every game I play, and while Rad Gravity frustrated me as a kid, as an adult it's a game that's worth popping in to remind players of a time when no idea was too wacky and players were left to their own devices to figure things out. If you go in expecting a decent game that's held from its full potential by an unfair difficulty and lack of direction, you're going to enjoy the adventures of Rad Gravity, especially if you look at it as a product of its time rather than comparing it to modern standards. 
It's a really quirky game with some really neat ideas, and it makes a great conversation piece as part of your NES collection. Well, that's all for this episode. In order to keep up with what's going on with the backlog, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, check out our website, and like us on Facebook. If you want to know what I'm up to personally, you can check me out on Twitter as well.